I'm very, very happy to introduce today for our December 2020, last of 2020 um, Memory Lab Network webinars, Zach Ellis, who is the founder of the Oral History Platform, Their Story. And so thank you so much, Zach, for being here today and for um, telling us about their story and giving us a little demo, I believe, and mm -hmm. answering any questions we have. So please take it away. Absolutely. Well. Uh, Siobhan, thank you so much for having me and uh, definitely a, a pleasure to be uh, with you all uh, today. Well, before we get started, especially because we have a small group, I'd love to maybe hear a little bit about, um, you know, Heather and Jonathan, your work and the institutions that, that you're working with, and then I can absolutely dive into, uh, you know, all things, their story and give a demo. We'll, we'll make it just uh, an open discussion um uh not a one-way thing we'll make it as interactive uh, as possible but uh yeah heather you want to maybe share just a little bit about yourself and sure where you work um i am with the central arkansas library system we're in little rock arkansas and um i work at the roberts library which is the archives special collections art um division of the library i'm i by training, by degree, I'm a public historian, not a librarian. Um, I'm a really bad oral historian because I like to talk too much. I don't allow my narrator to talk. <laughs> so I didn't do really well with that, but I can facilitate programs for them. <laughs> so, um, and so at the Roberts Library, we have um, our, like I said, our archives division. We also have the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. We're the only um, public library that has a state encyclopedia tied to it. And mm -hmm. so that's one of my main functions is to oversee that. Um, actually, I, they probably would say I just bug them. Um, I just annoy them and make them do things they don't want to do. So, um, but but that's kind of what we do and we're, I mean, the, the memory lab has been a really exciting project to us because we've really tried, we're trying, a, you know, in the last two years to make stuff as accessible as possible, you know, that anybody can come to an archive, you don't have to be a scholar, you don't have to be an academic to come and, um, and look at stuff. And so I think the memory lab is a great way for us to get um, people involved. And we have a very large oral history collection at the Roberts Library as part of the Butler Center. We have lots of names. Um, but we had our former director was um, an oral historian. He had gotten his degree from Baylor. And so he, um, you know, oral history was very important to him. So we've done projects about um, Korean War veterans, Vietnam War veterans with Arkansas connections. Um, of course, because of what happened here in 1957 with the desegregation of schools. We've done a lot of African-American oral histories trying to capture those stories, so. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I think this will be a fun uh, discussion uh, with uh, oral history being such a, a core part of, uh, of, of what the library is doing with you. And Jonathan, what, uh, what about you? Uh, yeah, um, my name is uh, Jonathan Waltmeyer. I work for the Tulare County uh, Library, and we are uh, based in Visalia, California. It's kind of the center of the state. When I tell people where you know where we're at, they you know everyone thinks of LA or San Francisco and beaches. We're actually in the middle of like the most fertile farmland in the U.S. Um, and uh, so. Uh, to try to put it geographically, we're about 45 minutes to an hour away from Sequoia National Park. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, uh, there's a lot of history there. Uh, myself, I am a librarian by training, but I've always had an interest in history and particularly local history. And that's kind of how I got this job. They were looking for someone to manage their uh, local history room and their archives. And they basically gave me, you know, the keys to the, to the to the room and said, do with it what you will. And so we are a research archives. We're open to the public. We get scholars. We get a lot of the public, though. Um, and uh, so we do handle a lot of uh, materials relating to just Tulare County. Um, and uh, 
uh, we do uh, things like uh, we have a photo collection, we have a rare book collection, we have a vault, um, we have oral histories, not a whole lot. I'm looking to change that. Um, and because uh, we do have some oral histories from the World War II era, we have some oral uh, interviews from uh, some Native American tribes that are nearby on the Tule River Reservation. And uh, so, uh, we, and we just got um, some oral histories from a local museum and we're actually in the process of uploading them to a larger initiative in California called California Revealed, um, where um, they're trying to save a lot of this obsolete media, oral histories, pretty much anything that's California history related. So I'm actually doing quality control on the metadata uh, harvesting for that. And um, so the, the idea is that uh, as part of the memory lab, we do want to have an oral history component to it. And uh, so I've got, um, I was able to hustle a small grant from uh, the local historical society to do a mobile uh, memory lab. And part of, the, part of the components is we are going to be doing Audacity and we're going to have some interview equipment. Hmm. So, um, and I saw my, uh, my colleague, Amy, uh, pop up just briefly. Um, Amy is my partner in crime. She is uh, the curator at the Tulare County Museum. And, uh, we're, and so uh, Amy has actually organized a, collab uh, a uh, coalition of local museums um, called the Museum Alliance of Tulare County. And she can, I hope she comes back, she'll tell you more. And uh, so the mobile memory lab will be available to those museums. So if they wanna do community history days, then they could do oral interviews. And uh, so that way we can collect that information, we could add it to our collection, and then we could add it to California Revealed. Um, so uh, we're looking to build our collection a lot more just because um, we, we need to try to preserve as much of our cultural history as we can. And uh, I know uh, in California, at least, there's the interest in doing that in our area has been around for about 40 years. But before that, not as much. You know, it was always pass the photos to someone else, you know, to someone in the family. Um, so we're really trying to preserve our, our cultural heritage. Fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like oral histories is a, a growing uh, area of interest uh, for you and, and even connected not just on uh, um, the local level, but bubbling up to the California Revealed project. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. It looks like Amy is maybe just joining. Yeah, hi, Amy. Um, we were just introducing ourselves since we have a small number. Hi. Um, so Jonathan did a little brief uh, mention of you, but if you want to say um, a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from organization-wise and anything about oral histories. Uh, sure, yeah, I uh, I run the Tulare County Museum in Visalia, California, and um, so some of the oral histories that we have done um, is we do different cultural exhibits, and so as part of that, we interview people in the community that are um, part of that cultural group, so we've We've done maybe 13 different ones and we have like Italian and Croatian and all that. So just capturing those oral histories um, is important for us, but then they also get turned into a video that um, people can see in our theater that's part of the exhibit. Um, and so I'm just interested in learning more about that because I think we have a lot to capture in the area. And so, um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, and I'll be curious uh, as we go today, even exploring uh, the, the ideas of how, uh, how you might easily combine uh, oral histories and kind of create those finished uh, uh, products. There's some future looking things that I might, you know, I might show around that. Um, before I get started, Javon, anything that you want to add or anything for you that's of particular note or interest? Um, not too, not so much, just that, um, 
I feel like, you know, there's, there's a, and I've said this before, but there's a definite connection between the memory lab and oral histories, um, both like digitizing them. That's the more obvious one. Like if we have ones that are on compact cassettes, right in our collections, or if people bring stuff in, but, um, so there's that connection, but then, you know, with the memory lab, um, it's, we're all about metadata too, about having people to explain and give more context around their um, personal archives and memories. Um, so there's definitely a connection. I mean, it's still a bit loose, like um, our, in DC, like our oral history program is separate from our memory lab, but um, it, it also makes sense for other places, I think, to have them more intertwined. So like out in Frederick County Public Library, remember Becca came uh, and showed us their like mobile lab when you guys were in uh, in DC, like almost a year ago now. Um, yeah, so, so they do it like they travel with their digitization equipment and oral history equipment. So, um, you know, there's an obvious tie in that um, I think is there that I'm really glad that we're gonna like explore with Zach, uh, his platform, and also like the connection of like aviary too, which is something I kind of want to get you guys introduced to as well. So that's it. Thank you for asking. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll mention one thing before I share my screen and kind of walk through everything was, uh, I mean, Heather, what, what you had said before kind of struck me around uh, you know, one of the things that's important to you is recording people's stories before they die. And uh, the reason that I even got into all of this, I mean, I had been working in tech out in San Francisco and was in, uh, you know, a, you know, deeply technical, like technology infrastructure startup. I was in home care and, and I was in a math education company, but it wasn't until um, actually at my uncle's funeral that my dad had said to me that one of his biggest regrets was never recording his dad's stories before he died. And so, I mean, I had known that for a while after that point, but didn't do anything about it until one day I was in Amsterdam, in the Anne Frank house, in the attic, and there was an oral history plane of her father, Otto, talking about how he had never realized the depth and complexity of Anne's thoughts until after she had died and he read her diary. And so he concluded in the video that because he had had such a close relationship with Anne but never really knew who she was that most parents don't really know their kids. And so it hit me, well, if, you know, most parents don't know their kids, how could I possibly know who my parents are? And so I decided I was gonna start a project recording my parents telling their life stories and my sharing things with them that I had never shared with them before as well. And the problem was I was in San Francisco, they were in Rochester, New York. And so their story kind of emerged as a solution to our own family's problem about how at a distance um, could we record and then preserve those stories in a space that was private, owned by our family, but easily accessible now and for future generations. So that's kind of uh, blossomed a bit into what their story is today, which is really focused on an oral history platform to serve uh, communities and, and institutions. I kind of see family as just the first community of which we're all a part and that the same process of, um, you know, not just kind of the creation of these assets being valuable, but, um, but actually the process itself of engaging in self-reflection and these open dialogues with each other serve to deepen our relationships and and, uh, and strengthen our capacity for better communication. And I think that same process can take place on, on the communal level. And so we're now working um, across, uh, uh, and, and as uh, Siobhan had referenced, we're, we're partnering with a few different uh, platforms uh, together. When, when I think about oral and public history, think about it in terms of four major buckets and those being collection, preservation, access, and then public use or engagement with, with those uh, materials. And so their story, we really focus on collection and streamlining collection and some post-processing things around transcription, transcript editing, indexing, but then with platforms like Aviary for, um, uh, for publishing and access and searchability, and then permanent most recently for preservation. And I'll share a little bit about that 
uh, as we go. Um, so today we're working with just over 27 uh, now institutions, um, everything from the University of Kentucky's Nunn Center for Oral History, the National Library Board of Singapore, um, nine different uh, Jewish museums who are doing a nationwide collection initiative around what does it mean to be uh, Jewish during the era of COVID, to smaller communities. We have a convent in, uh, in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, interviewing sisters uh, to the Chickaloo native village of the Atna tribe in South Central uh, Alaska. And, uh, and that I think really speaks to our mission, which is to empower uh, any community to take ownership over their own narrative and to take kind of the, the processes that have been really costly, resource intensive and, and to, you know, tough to do at scale, kind of the things that the Shoah Foundation has done and to say, how can we use modern technology to make that accessible to anyone? And so let me show a little bit of the, the platform in, in what it looks like. And, and I'm gonna pause kind of as we're going. Um, I know that was kind of a big wind up to kind of who we are, but I'll, I'll show a little bit. I'm gonna pause, please interrupt me at any time. Um, and let's make this as interactive throughout as possible. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show um, instead of starting with their story, I'm actually going to begin with the end in mind and show an accessible collection that was recorded using their story and then kind of work backwards to say, well, how did we get here? How, how is that created? Um, so this platform here that we're looking at is Aviary. And Aviary was originally built um, by archivists, for archivists, uh, built by an organization called AVP, uh, Audiovisual Preservation. Uh, they work with folks like Library of Congress, uh, with uh, uh, Harvard and, and their archives, Yale, and specifically Aviary was originally developed for Yale's Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust testimonies, all around tackling two challenges. One was, how do we allow any individual, whether that is your internal team, whether it's an educator, a student, the general public, how do we help them to find the moments that are interesting to them, not just in a single, audiovisual you know, interview, but across an entire collection. Um, that being traditionally really hard with, with uh, audiovisual um, materials, especially the, the longer they are. The second main challenge that they address is around permissions and levels of access. Uh, obviously the goal is to kind of engage the public um, and make these materials accessible, but not everything needs to be public or at least not right away. And so how, how can we do that in, with really fine granularity? So those are the two challenges that they kind of address. So what we can do through Aviary, if I look at this example collection here with the Five Oaks Museum, is I can search kind of across the, this collection. So the Five Oaks Museum had been interviewing um, members of the Portland, Oregon community around how they've been impacted by the pandemic. And so each of these have been automatically transcribed uh, and some of them uh, even indexed. And if I search for the term immigrant, for example, then I can get back all the recordings uh, in this collection where uh, that search term, uh, in this case, immigrant shows up, whether it's a keyword, whether it's in the description, the transcript, or even in the index. And so if I double down on this recording here with MECDES, um, then we can see an example here of an index. We have this kind of chapterized structure. Each of these chapters having a summary, keywords, um, and uh, those chapters being connected to the media. If I click uh, on that chapter, it'll skip to that moment. But even more deeply than that, um, we can see where that search term shows up in, in, other, in other areas, whether it's in the, meta, the interview level metadata, whether it's even down at the level of the transcript. And so I can skip ahead and find all the moments where that term immigrant was mentioned. And if I unplug my headphones here so you can hear this and turn up the volume, I can even click on the word. Part of the experience of being an immigrant. And skip to that exact moment in the recording. So we went from the level of the collection straight to a precise moment. Um, I'm gonna show one other thing and then I'm gonna stop uh, for a second. So 
not only can we more easily navigate a collection this way, but we can also pull out kind of powerful moments that we might want to share, uh, whether it's to be used in say an educational resource or maybe you kick off a workshop by, by paying a, a clip and start to discuss it, or you highlight the collection this way uh, online or through social media or so on and so forth. And so um, using Aviary's playlist, um, I can actually go in and grab discrete uh, clips or, or highlights that I want to pull out. And so I've pulled out one here. I've called it, uh, we're all immigrants at this time. You'll hear Mekdes say those words. Uh, she had immigrated from Ethiopia and talks a little bit about how her immigration experience has shaped her perspective during the pandemic. Uh, and she was a, a high school senior at the time of this recording. And, and this is a, a public uh, a recording um, as well. So I'll play this for you. It's about 45 seconds. And then I'm going to stop uh, and pause. I think part of the experience of being an immigrant is sort of processing change as you move through it and as you experience it. And I think for a lot of us now, I think whether we, you know, we intentionally think about it, whether we like it or not, we're sort of immigrating through experiences. You mm -hmm. know, we've also, you know, I just, does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. people immigrate through space, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we're immigrating through experience. We've yeah. all immigrated. We're all immigrants at this time. So I think a big challenge is going to be how are we going to process the change? So I, I love sharing that clip. One, it just, you know, I'm always astounded that Mekdes was a high school senior at at the time of that uh, recording. Um, but, uh, but two, just to highlight that ability of kind of pulling out the, these powerful moments that we might want to, uh, uh, to share, to, to highlight the collection, use however, however, however we might in exhibit, so on and, and so forth. But let me pause there for a second. Um, thoughts, comments, questions on, on anything so far? No? Okay, I'll keep going then. Uh, so I'm gonna plug my headphones back in, one second. So that recording was done through, uh, through their story. Uh, each of these recordings uh, in Aviary can easily be shared, they can be embedded. Um, and so as an example of that, um, if we go, backwards a little bit to the Viral Story Project landing page. The Viral Story Project was a larger collection initiative that the Five Books Museum was participating in around the impact of COVID in different communities. And so we can see for one, here is that recording embedded back on the webpage. We can also see, for example, some individual uh, uh, testimonies. And so these were all recorded through their story. And to show kind of how that recording uh, works, I'm going to show something that's actually unique to their story rel uh, relative to other platforms. We can see here that you can certainly have a synchronous recording. It's a uh, video conferencing technology, much like Zoom. You can also elicit recordings asynchronously. And so to show that, what we've, uh, what we've done is uh, added a link uh, underneath this record button. And if I open up this, uh, uh, this button. I could just click on it, but I'm logged in in their story. So I wanna show kind of what it looks like if you're not logged in. Uh, so I'm gonna open it up in an incognito uh, window. And what we can do is we come to a video call page. Uh, if it's the first time I'm using it, I can just hit allow for my microphone and uh, camera. And we see some questions here up at the top. So how have you been impacted by the pandemic? What challenges have you experienced? What gives you hope? And so I can record my response to those by just pressing this record button. I know that it's working because the counter is going up 
the record button is pulsing red. If someone arrives at this page from a mobile device, we actually pop out the record button. So it's big front and center in, in the same place as it would be for an Instagram story. So we try to make it as easy to use as possible. And when I'm done, I can just hit stop recording or just hit hang up, either one will work. And we do metadata uh, collection at the point of recording. So right away, you can view back your recording. You can add in some metadata. When you set up this collection campaign as the institution, you can do some configurations like whether or not it's required that someone adds an email address. Um, I'll say a nice description. You can add tags. And one of the things that is really important to us is making oral history best practices the easiest practice through the platform. We've been in close collaboration with Doug Boyd, uh, the former presidents of the Oral History Association for three years now and uh, has been a close uh, kind of advisor uh, of, of the platform. And one of the things that's really important to us is ethical capture. And so you can actually, as an institution, create your own custom terms that can be agreed to at the point of, of recording. So right now I can download the recording for myself, but I can't yet submit it to the archive until I agree to those terms. Once I do, then I can hit save and I'm taken to uh, a default, uh, a default uh, thank you page on their story, or you can even set up your own custom redirect. If you wanna send them to your website or set up your own thank you page, you can set that up through the platform as well. So kind of, well, where did this recording go? Uh, if I keep working backwards into the guts of their story. So we have this idea of groups, uh, which really correspond to projects, um, uh, if you will. And so this is the viral story project group where we can see those recordings done by the Five Oaks Museum. And here's that one with Mechdes. And if I refresh the page now, because we have a new recording, a la me, then we'll see in just a second as the page loads back up that our new recording is here. And you can see that the terms are associated with it. We have our metadata and I to connect back to Aviary, we can directly export that recording to Aviary. You don't have to download, re-upload the metadata, anything like that. We can just choose the, uh, the collection. We can choose the level of privacy from com completely private just for our own internal purposes to public to even in between where it's cert it's discoverable, but you have to request for access. Uh, and so if I just hit continue there and that's it. And then it syncs directly to, to Aviary where it can become searchable in the ways that I showed before. Let me stop here again. Thoughts, questions, comments on any of this. So that, um, that like customization of the questionnaire, that's possible through their story. That's like part yep. of it, part of, it's baked in sort of thing. Okay. Yes, that, that is baked in. So we have this notion here of preparing a session. Um, and when you do that, then you can choose whether it's this kind of asynchronous mode or as you saw with some of the others, when there was more than one person, if it's in a group mode. Uh, and then for the questions, this is where you create them. You, um, we, we have some example questions that people can use, um, but you can always, and you can edit those, um, or you can just uh, uh, write your own. For example, and then those questions show up in uh, in the recording in the same order in which you uh, write them. Um, I had a question about, um, do you, is it automatically just available for people to search and look at, or is there some sort of review process in case there's like any inappropriate things on there or how does that work? Totally, totally. So their story is completely private. There's no public side to their story. Uh, and we have a notion of, uh, of an organization within uh, their story. Actually, the only way to create an account on their story is with an organizational code. 
Uh, so we meet and speak with every institution that's using the platform before they even sign up. Um, and those recordings are totally private to you. So the way to, to share them uh, outside of the platform is to either uh, take them out by downloading the recording uh, directly. You can download it as an MP4. Uh, you can also uh, uh, download the recording as a WAV file. Uh, and we do, uh, actually just this week, we, we released the ability to record locally on each person's device. So uh, kind of mitigates uh, any perturbances you might have based on uh, intermittent internet connections. Uh, so you have a separate uh, uncompressed WAV file recorded on each person's device that you can download separately or even use the platform to mix together and then take that out. So then you can use it however you want or for example, make it accessible through aviary, which is, um, uh, and even within aviary, you can choose whether to keep it private or, or public. So there are many gates to um, before it's out in the open. Okay, so anyone can just record and submit that, but then you decide who can access right. that. Oh, okay. right, exactly. Yeah, and the way the way to um, to allow anyone to to record, uh, uh, for example, is that um, when you create that prepared session, as we call it. Uh, uh, within their story, you get a, uh, a link that you can send out to individuals. So you can send it just by email, by WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, however you want to get it to them. They just need to access it on a device that is uh, internet connected and has a camera. That's it. Uh, it can be a mobile phone, an iPad, laptop, doesn't matter. Uh, and it's one link to rule them all. You can send that link to anyone and it'll create a new recording for each person. Um, kind of as an example of that, let me, yeah. So as an example of that, I've actually used that personally. Uh, my dad's 70th birthday was last year. And as a surprise for his birthday, my mom, my sister and I reached out to about 20 of his friends from throughout his life and had them record a story uh, about my dad. And so it was just you know, a really meaningful way uh, for us to, uh, to give back to my dad for all that he has done uh, for us. But you can see here, People kind of recorded wherever they were on their own time. Most people are maybe, you know, 70 years plus or minus, so really easy to use. Um, and they could just record. They didn't have to install any software. They didn't have to create an account. They just click the link, record, that's it. And then it comes back to the platform uh, where it's private for, uh, for just me at that point. And then I can choose how to share it. And that's me with, without my COVID hair. Other thoughts, questions before I keep going? I guess the, um, yeah, so you say, so yeah, how do you get to be, to, be, to use their story? Like you have to be an organization. Yeah, you can, you can be, uh -huh. you can be, a, you know, an individual or family too. We have individual practitioners that use the platform. Um, Library of Congress, Archie Greenfellow is using the platform. Um, a, a number of other uh, individual practitioners are. And, and we do have separate pricing specifically for family use, which is generally much lower volume, maybe a couple hours a year. Uh, they're not really transcribing you know, the, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, we don't say no to any family. Um, and in fact, there's oftentimes when we start working with an institution, someone says, hey, I want to use this on my own, even outside the institution. So that kind of happens, but we focus on working specifically with institutions to help facilitate oral history projects and kind of um, community engagement. Yeah, and it's an annual subscription is how it works. So we just kind of talk about it, figure out uh, kind of the package that makes the most sense. It's all based on usage. Um, and then you can operate that over any number of projects, any number of people. Usage like uh, storage? Like, uh, like number of hours of recording, number okay. of minutes, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So for example, um, like American University is using the platform uh, in a number of projects 
One is in their digital humanities, um, uh, the humanities truck that Dan Kerr uh, has. Um, so they're using it there. They're using it in several classes uh, where students are doing their own student-led projects about whatever topic is interesting to them and then using the platform as a class to actually um, go out, do recordings, but then they use that group mechanism uh, for their specific class um, and as a way to, to share recordings with, with each other. Um, and we have it set up uh, in a way such that, um, so there's kind of two levels or, or roles in their story. There's just an individual user um, and then there's an organizational manager. So the professor is given the organizational manager role, which means that they can actually see all of the recordings of any individual that's recording with their organization so that they can make sure that's not being used for illicit purposes or, or purposes just outside of what the school is sponsoring. Um, but th just they see that and the, and the student. And then, so it's privacy is really important to us. Uh, and then only if a student wants other students to be able to see it, do they share it into the shared group um, with, with each other. And then they can learn what questions is everyone asking, so on and so forth. Um, um, I've been auditing a class with Brooklyn College, uh, a graduate level oral history class that's using the platform. And so like once a week when we all get together, students will pick like a one minute snippet um, from uh, their interviews uh, and share that we'll talk about interviewing technique and style, and it'll just open up kind of deeper conversations about the content and how the students relate to it. And I think it really helped to create like a cohesive and uh, a class, uh, especially during the pandemic. So um, class usage has been uh, growing uh, among different universities. I was gonna say, I, this is just a comment, but I feel like the uh, pandemic must have just like, this is, ideal I would say you know if you have an internet connection and a camera like you said like you're this is ideal for social distancing so yeah right right yeah well and that's one of the things that we've tried to instill in people I guess is that I think the word oral history scares a lot of people and um the oral historians that I know and I know quite Quite a few get really into like the minutia of the sound of the audio or the you know the follow-up question and all of this and and I think that that sometimes terrifies just your average person and I try to talk about it as a conversation you're not you know and, and if you can put the recorder in the middle of the table on Thanksgiving, or you have a Zoom call during this crazy year at Thanksgiving, record it, you know, just capturing it. Because yeah, it's, um, it's so important to get them. And so my former boss, the, the guy with the degree from Baylor from ages ago, he's ancient. Um, and I mean that in the nicest way, but, um, he has, he has always said, and I mean, this is a tr trained oral historian. He says, um, getting the C quality interview captured is better than not getting the A quality. So, you know, right. you just, you have to do it. And, and the recorder scares people, you know, this, the, the, inter, the interviewer, I mean, the interviewee, the narrator, that's terrifying. But I think right. Zoom or those, these electronic platforms, if you really don't, if you don't pay attention to the little red button flashing, the, you know, light flashing at the top, you, yeah, so. Yeah, totally. And that's a, that's a great point. I mean, people who have used their story for, uh, for remote interviews, uh, I think I've really found that it is just simple to use and less intimidating. And one of the interesting things that I've noticed, and I think you kind of alluded to this, is that you didn't even allude. I mean, you said, you know, the recorder scares people. Like it, it, it is a third party. It's, it's another observer that is visibly apparent. But one of the things that's interesting about remote recordings, um, and, and, I, and I should say that I think nothing, uh, here I am, you know, the the founder of a video platform, but not, nothing I think replaces being in person with someone and the intimacy of, of being in person. That said, um, 
there is something to be said about when you are having a remote call and the mechanism or the medium of communication is the same as the medium of recording. And so there isn't that third observer. Um, you kind of don't notice, you just are talking to this person, the same as what we're all used to at this point of talking over video conferencing platforms anyways. And so it actually, you can create a bit of an intimate moment. I mean, there are other challenges about making sure people have their phone off and you know every the craziness of everyone is at home and you have the, the kids running around the dog. And so there's other things that can kind of get in the way of being present, but the technology, we can actually do some good things about letting it kind of melt away. I do, I have a, another question. Um, did you, like those academic uh, oral historians of which I am absolutely not one, um, yeah, or even close to that, uh, ha have, do you like have any on an advisory board to like, you know, for those questions that you have automatically in there, did they kind of contribute or was it more like what worked for you when you were going through your experience? Yeah, it was, it was a bit of, it was a bit of both. Um, and I think generally people come up with, with their own questions, they make it you know, unique to whatever that that interview is. Um, you know, it's meant to be there as a, a way to, to spark ideas. Um, and it's especially made for that asynchronous kind of situation when you're when you're using the questions to, to send those out because there isn't an interviewer, uh, or at least not in the moment. Um, but yeah, so a, a combination of when we came up the questions of, of my own experience looking outside at at other question banks and and yeah and talking with oral historians yeah we're so you know we're advised by Doug Boyd been working cl closely with Mike Frisch and as we work with more and more communities every community we work with uh, you know one of our values is to build with not for and so that's part of the fun for me is uh, that we we are a dedicated to the to serving the oral history community and building this together as we go with them right and that's how I I met you, I e-met you, uh, was at the EMEA Oral History Committee um, whenever that was in November. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. I think, yeah, I, I mean, I the way that I view, I, I was really lucky. The last company that I worked at uh, is called Desmos. Uh, they were, they built math software for teachers and students to be used in the classroom. And uh, I just learned a heck of a lot from them. One half of their team were former math teachers and they were super skeptical of their own technology and they were in classrooms all the time. They were teaching lessons using Desmos. They were observing teachers uh, teach lessons and they just really um, believed in making sure that, that any tech that's built serves you know, real classrooms, real teachers, and it's not tech for tech sake. And I, I kind of a, try to approach it the same way here. Like we we need to become a part of, uh, in, of the oral history community and thought leaders in it, not from the tech side, but, but from uh, you know, just how oral history is done in, in, in the modern age and learn from uh, you know, people who have been doing this for, for decades uh, and, and then also uh, kind of try and push the boundaries and leverage a little bit of what, what I've learned from being in tech, but uh, everything in service of pedagogy and service of uh, ethics and that's how we approach it. Other questions or comments? There's other things that I can definitely show. Maybe I'll show a little bit more. So while their story certainly allows for remote capture, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that you know, we see oral and public history as being about collection, preservation, access, and use of those materials. So remote capture is just one piece of the process. And I think really the process is what is challenging and, and the logistics of the process is what becomes uh, challenging. One, one of those big challenges is certainly transcription uh, and indexing and how do we make things uh, more searchable. Um, so as an example of this, uh, let me pull up uh, maybe one like this. Move the zoom. There we go. Um, so with their story, we can automatically generate a transcript 
Uh, we use Google's speech to text technology in the background for that. And so once the uh, transcript is generated, then we have a built in uh, transcript editor uh, where you can obviously do edits, you can update speakers uh, as you change the uh, of the transcript, you can resync it. So we just saw I created a new paragraph. I resynced it. The time code updated, and it's connected to the media. If I click on a word, it'll skip to the beginning of that paragraph here. So really trying to help to streamline that process of uh, of editing. And anything that you put into their story, you can get out. And we really have a focus on interoperability. And so one is we can export um, transcripts in multiple formats. So closed captions, SRT, VTT. Um, there's also, uh, this was, came out of our work with American University, they use Islandora, and one of the, the things that they needed was a way to upload VTT transcripts, not as closed captions, but actually as much more legible paragraphs, and so we built a new feature um, based on that to make it more interoperable with Islandora, where we can actually download as VTT, but specifically in the same format as what it looks like in paragraph form, so the, even the time-coded transcript becomes more legible. Um, and that can be reflected uh, uh, here in this recording with, uh, with MECDES, where we can see more of that paragraph form, uh, so a little bit easier uh, to read. We can also export in other formats, so TXT, Word, and even specifically with OM. So again, focus on interoperability with existing tools in the, uh, in the oral history community. Um, and so one of the things that you can do with, uh, with OMS is actually just download uh, an OMS ready transcript. We'll transform everything in the background um, and allow you to upload that uh, directly uh, uh, to OMS uh, to make that uh, more, uh, more accessible. Um, does anyone here use OMS or have you thought about using OMS? Only just like heard about it and know it's a thing. <laughs> so it's cool that you could do that. But <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll, practical. Yeah. I'll show you just like what an example of something that uses ohms looks like in the wild uh, for an oral history collection. I won't, maybe I won't go deep, deeper than that unless there's interest. But so this is an example the Yiddish Book Center uh, used ohms with their Wexler oral history collection. And they, I really think, have this like beautiful implementation uh, uh, of ohms. Where if I drill down into the full interview here, I have to move the zoom videos around. Um, then we can actually see uh, this is ohms. Ohms allows you to display an index and transcript uh, in a way that it's searchable. So if I search for, for example, family, uh, I can find all of the chapters in the recording where, uh, where that uh, is played. I can share that, just that segment link. I can play that segment, same thing. I can display the, the transcript, find all the moments uh, throughout the recording where, um, where a certain term is, is found. And, but now this is embedded back on their own site, um, which is one of the powerful uh, aspects of, uh, of OMS. Um, and so everything that we, that you can get in their story is completely directly uploadable to ohms, um, whether it's a transcript or, uh, or an index. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things that I like about their story is like the integrations with other, uh, well, standards in this way where exporting is such an important part um, with lots of different options of the standards that are out there. There's my dog. And, um, but then also like, yeah, the option to just be able to download the files yourself and then the, or put it to aviary, or um, I know I saw you had on there. Permanent. Uh, permanent, yes. Which I'd love for you to kind of talk on because I'm hoping that we'll, we'll talk more about it for the memory lab in the future, but just sort of a little. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. And let me real quick um, uh, time check. How how are we? Um, 
Yeah, we haven't, uh, we usually schedule an hour and a half. Um, so right. we have like another half hour, but you know, like if you want to stop early, that's fine too. Like totally. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm good. So long, so long as you all are, are interested in, uh, in, in all of this, I, I'm, I'm good to, uh, to keep going. So, um, Zach, yes. I'm sorry. I had to go, um, I had to go check on sixth grade math. Um, and so I missed, have you said, did you say something about, um, how does the transcription work? Are you, is, is it an automatic? Okay. 20 years ago, <laughs> um, I worked with some folks from Buffalo, New York, trying to develop a program that would automatically transcribe oral history. Cause you know, that's, the, that's the thing nobody wants to do. I mean, who, who wants to, I mean, you really need to be a court reporter, right? To, <laughs> to go in and transcribe that stuff. So how does your transcription, yeah. I mean, how does it go from audio to, and granted in 20 years, technology has come a long way. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, so we use Google's speech to text technology mm -hmm. in the background. Um, uh, and that's how we generate our transcripts. Um, how does it do with accents? Yeah. It, Ac accents can be tough. It depends, um, but that's yeah. It's going to be the same across almost any kind yeah. of speech to text. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's the question of why did you choose Google? Um, yeah, because I've been using Trent and been pretty happy with it. But you know, the Baltimore accent isn't too. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Totally. Um, so why do we choose Google? So one is that I would have loved to have used Trent because I mean, I didn't want to build our own transcript editor. Uh, but uh, so why do we use Google? Well, so Google just has a really simple API that allows us to use the speech to text tech in our own platform. Whereas Trent, um, they don't have the, that kind of embeddable uh, functionality. Um, so that, that, is, that is why uh, ultimately we would have had to, uh, the pricing model would have, would have been much different. Like for us transcribing using Google speech to text is two cents um, a minute. Uh, if we were using Trent to be, it'd be a lot more. And so we would, we would have to pass that cost on to, um, onto our customers. And our goal is to make this as, as accessible as possible. So ultimately we decided to use an open source transcript editor that's built actually by someone who used to work at the BBC and now the Wall Street Journal. Um, so uh, yeah, so we decided to use our own open source transcript editor, use the, the tech of Google and specifically why Google is, uh, you know, their goal is to uh, organize all the world's information and they have YouTube, they process more audiovisual technology, uh, you know, more audiovisual material than, than anyone else. So if they're focused on building the best algorithms for processing speech, they're probably going to, you know, be pretty, pretty good over time. So that was why we chose Google. Yeah. Yeah. I do like, um, that it's not like, it doesn't send you out to another place to, to correct your transcripts, to do your transcript editing. Cause I mean, so I was actually literally just having this co uh, conversation with, um, Emily Vinson from Houston, uh, university of Houston. Um, and she did like a whole a bunch of tests of various transcription software and options to try and pick the best one for them. And she's she deals with a lot of accents um, for their from their collection uh, as well, which is regional based. And um, yeah, it seems like she she said like it just there doesn't seem to be like a best option. Right. And it's and you're gonna have to go in there and clean things up. Like yep. it's just, that's, uh, you, you're going to have to do that. And then, but it definitely is way better to have the machines do that hard work for you of, instead of having, you know, a court reporter in there, like you said, Heather, like at least that this part is there. And it's sort of like, I mean, I, I think it's, it's come so much further, even just when I was looking into this, like five years ago, um, totally. and it should get better and better. Right. Totally, totally. And I think, I think the things that will get better about it might not be that it's going to be perfect right off the bat. Like, you know, that's maybe like the holy grail that, that won't be found. But what will get better is better ways to interact with the transcript and to update it, uh, whether it is being able to, as it's read out loud, 
make a correction verbally. Uh, I, I've seen, we've worked with folks who are building that sort of technology, whether it is having a controlled vocabulary for proper nouns that are really important. Um, and so it uh, makes the correction process much faster or it even makes the, the, the speech to text technology better at guessing things like proper nouns. Um, so yeah, so I, I think what will get better is like how we actually can really quickly correct um, as humans as opposed to the complete offload uh, of it to machines. Right, like humans are still necessary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, are, <laughs> you can't get rid of us yet, AI, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. I was um, like thinking like, oh my God, what, how would a, how would a tra like Trent do my name, you know, <laughs> if they right. it? Shabon. Yeah, good luck. Um, yeah, yeah. It, would, it, would, it, would, it would need to have a controlled vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. So, and so uh, just to reiterate, like the cost, because of the way that you, you ended up doing it, the cost doesn't get passed down to, to users. It's, it's not like the more that you do, well, I mean, the more that you, you the more recordings you do, yes, the more you pay, but uh, it's not like. Right. We can, we can make it much cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we're paying two cents a minute as opposed to a dollar. That makes um, sense. Yeah. You don't have a bunch of in-app purchases. Right. Or, right. You know, no. Yeah. Yeah. As the mother of a 12-year-old who loves video games, I miss the days where you had a cartridge and you put it in the machine and you played the game and then you were done. Like right. you didn't buy, you know, a new tank every other day and, you know. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, yeah. this is like. The equivalent of uh, of the cartridge for um, you know oral history professionals. <laughs> this is the fun game that you get to plug and play. Yeah, I hope that's our goal. Um, there, there is. Um, I we have some time, so I I, I definitely want to make sure that I show permanent. But one comment just while we're on this thread around transcripts and accessibility, um, those sorts of things. So. One is that I think the idea of having a perfect transcript, that, or I should say there are reasons to have an imperfect transcript, or that an imperfect transcript is good enough uh, for d depending on the use case. Uh, I mean, imperfect transcripts are great for, one, you might not even have to show them. They can actually be used for SEO, and it's hidden, but it's, it's crawlable. Uh, it's, you know, if it's a public recording, it's okay that, you know, something's crawling it. Uh, it can be used to help draw attention to, the, to a collection. Uh, potentially even more important, it, it makes audiovisual material way more accessible and searchable. Uh, and that is, that is the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges in my mind of audiovisual material is how do you find the moments that are interesting? And if you can at least search, and maybe it's not 100% correct, but you can really quickly find the vicinity uh, of something based on just searching for a word, you just helped out a researcher, you just helped out anyone, you know, hugely. Uh, whether even if that's in the editing process, um, to be able to, to say, oh, I, I know I want to find moments that are about, um, uh, you know, racial equity. Let me search for the term racial equity and find, you know, for example. Um, so that, that's a big point. I, I will say one other thing, which is that. Um, indexing, I think, has become a pretty strong um, either addition and or alternative to transcription in that indexing we've seen can take 50% less time. You know, if, if, if correcting an hour of transcript, you know, is about six hours of work, plus or minus, um, creating an index for one hour of transcript tends to be somewhere between two to three hours. So one, it can be much cheaper. Uh, it can be faster uh, for the human to do um, and still lead to really accessible uh, uh, content. Um, a transcript might even be hard to read through uh, by the human eye. Whereas if I have something that is broken down into, hey, here are the compelling chapters and stories, if you will, in this material, and here's a quick synopsis on them, we can actually find those moments really quickly. And one of the powerful things about an index as well is that sometimes, uh, you know, I mentioned, oh, let's search for racial equity. Well, maybe that person didn't say, now I'm gonna tell you about racial equity. Maybe they just told you a story that that is a theme that's relevant. And so indexing also allows you to kind of have a level of that abstraction that can really help compare um, 
uh, across uh, uh, interviews and find moments that maybe someone didn't actually speak. So there's, I, I think um, indexing is definitely a, uh, a good alternative. And we have some tools that are uh, specifically around uh, facilitating uh, indexing. Um, but before I go into those, let me, it, I'll, I'll do that if, I, if we have time. Uh, I'm gonna shift over to, uh, to permanent. Um, okay, so I've, we've kind of shown a little bit of, um, of their story of, of collecting in different fashions, whether synchronous or asynchronous. We've shown a little bit of their story, or excuse me, of, of aviary around access and searchability, navigability of, of collections. Um, but we haven't really talked about preservation, kind of another absolute key uh, piece of this stool and one that I've heard when I've talked to a number of people about when they submit like collection grants, especially during the pandemic, where a number of people have been rejected because they didn't have a sustainability angle. So preservation is definitely a really uh, a key piece. So we partner with um, an organization called uh, the Permanent Legacy Foundation. They build a uh, cloud storage platform dedicated to long-term preservation uh, access called uh, permanent. And so permanent is the first long-term preservation system or, or secure cloud storage system backed by a nonprofit. And they have an endowment model uh, like a university or a museum would. And so their idea is that you pay once for storage, no subscriptions, um, and that the cost of uh, digital storage is going down uh, and you know your endowment, uh, they invest and interest is going up. And so it's a self-sustaining model. Um, so one of the powerful, and they have a commitment to free storage for nonprofits uh, as well. They, they kind of do that. They don't say, hey, you have unlimited, but you, you kind of go in tranches. Um, and so uh, again, this idea of making this full end-to-end -end process of oral history accessible to anyone, especially communities that might have limited staff uh, resources or budget, uh, and we're trying to piece together what does the full what what is an example of a full pipeline look like? And then our goal over time is you know permanent is one preservation system, AVR is one access system. For example, we're working with you know the Chickaloon Native Village and they use uh, Mukatu, and so you know integrating with Mukatu. No downloads is our you know our our mantra. Just connected pipelines. Um, so with permanent, what is unique about our integration here is that as you do uh, a recording, you can choose to automatically have that uh, preserved through uh, permanent. Uh, here you can see uh, here's the option um, for doing a local recording if you want. I'm just going to go ahead and skip that for a moment. I'll do my recording as before. Now this is in our staging environment. We're looking to release this uh, very shortly. Um, but as soon as you do the recording, you can choose to have that uh, automatically synced to permanent. And so when I hit save uh, here, then we'll still have that recording here uh, you know, made available in their story. But in addition to that, the recording will automatically go to your permanent institutional archive. And then that's something that you can share back with, uh, with the narrator. And I think one of the things that uh, can often happen in oral history is, is we do, uh, you know, we give a testimony and maybe we can request access to it or, uh, you know, but it's not really given back uh, in a reciprocated fashion. And what we can do now with this, um, integration with permanent because their mission is to preserve the legacy of every individual. And they're really focused on personal archives is that I can take this link to permanent and right after the interview, I can immediately share that back with the narrator. And so if I open this up in an incognito browser uh, to simulate someone who doesn't you know, yet have a permanent account, um, I can share that link, which goes to a shared folder between the institution, the collecting institution and the individual. Um, I didn't put a title on, on uh, that recording I just did. So we just have it untitled, but if, it's, uh, if we put a title, then that'll show up. Uh, I can quickly create an account. Let's say Zach from lab.
make my password. And I can immediately get access to that recording, which I can uh, now make a copy of in my own personal archive. So promoting long-term preservation, not just for the institution, but also for the individual and their family. And not only that, but this also opens up a channel between the institution and the individual where they can now share back other materials related to that oral history, whether it's images, whether it's documents, permanent takes care, is, is, uh, takes care of all file types. And so now that can be shared back and kept organized um, with that uh, uh, oral history. Now, Jonathan asks uh, via chat, what cloud storage to, uh, service does permanent use, AWS, Google? And am I right? I think that I remember you saying it's, the, it's through the Internet Archive, but. Uh, so not through the Internet Archive. They, so Brewster Kale is, is actually a board member of theirs. So the founder of the Inter Internet Archive is a board member of, um, of permanent and they have an integration. They themselves have an integration with the Internet Archive, but no. So they, yeah, they use uh, AWS and uh, Backblaze. Um, and sorry, what was the last one? Black, Black, it's Black. called Backblaze. Backblaze, yes, okay. Double check me on that. <laughs> it's it's close to that name. But yeah, that sounds right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now that my brain is working. <laughs> um, great question, Jonathan. And I'm really hoping, um, and thank you, Zach, for uh, setting up that intro to permanent.org's um, director. Uh, I'm hoping to to have them on one of our webinars soon, maybe, hopefully, um, or at least come up with a bit more information for you guys uh, to be able to ask questions from them directly. But yeah. Any any other thoughts or comments on on any of this? If we if you're interested, I can show some of the indexing stuff, but also if not, it's okay too, but I'm, I'm okay for going up to the full hour and a half, whatever, whatever you all want. Well, one thing I think that's interesting and I'd love to hear everyone's like, I don't know, thoughts on it is just like, um, one of the whole like one pipeline is a really good idea. And it's really nice to have like, uh, um, to be able to have this like feeling like that people are developing these platforms and like listening and responding to what the needs are and not just the needs of, um, no offense to them, but Stanford or Harvard or, you know, like the people that can afford to hire um, technical folk to, to make something that works for them. You know, like uh, I had a lot of smaller organizations don't have that and community archives and things like that and families, certainly personal archives, um, the public like in general don't have that. And and so that's one of the things I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing is this integration of, of the different platforms together into one pipeline, like, like, like you said. But I mean, I also, and this is just a comment really, I, I see it as a, I mean, you're addressing the problem by having it all in one place. Um, but I, I also see like, it's 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 going to be a problem for archives and libraries and museums, et cetera, to have to constantly be um, advocating for. Another, you know, I can just see administration in certain places being like another platform. Now, what do we need this one for? You know, like, because um, I think that, but it's it's also a chance to. It's one of those things like I don't think that we should just because it's going to be hard we shouldn't um, that we should back away from it or avoid it. Uh, it's just that the it, just know that it's something that's there and I think that we're gonna have to keep talking about and doing more, especially like there's so much labor. That this is saving uh, you know that these types of things can save for us it can reach and expand new audiences if access is our way it is what we want then like you know, this is what it, we're given this like access that is so new and great that we didn't have before. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of ranting now. And what do you guys think? <laughs> do you foresee 
those types of conversations. And um, Jonathan says he's got connection issues, so he's going to have to chat in the chat box. Um, yeah, he really enjoys the transcription function. No more slogging through recordings. Integration is great. It's more streamlined. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I'm curious, like Amy, Heather, Johnson, John. What were like other main takeaways that you all had? Whether it's things that jumped out that are interesting, exciting, or even questions, concerns, things that you see that are missing. Um, uh, but relate, but you know, in related to to the work that uh, you're doing. Um, I I kind of agree with um, Siobhan about just being a smaller institution. It's like anytime we ask for anything, it's like, well, how much is this going to cost, and what is it for, and um, and also just having a small staff. I think that this is great because it allows other people to just record their own and and we would have access to that. And we, because we tried to do something like that. Somebody tried to create something like that maybe like 10 years ago. But then I had those same questions like, well, who's gonna approve this? Who's gonna do the transcription? Is there editing involved? You know, like what? So I feel like, this is nice because when you initially approach projects like this, it's like, that's a lot of work and I'm one person and what am I gonna do? Um, so I think this is great and it's something that I wanna look into uh, more and um, it seems like doable and actually usable. And I think um, even um, it could be something where, um, cause I, uh, last year created a museum alliance with all the museums in the county. So this could be something that if we all as a group use it and share the cost and then everybody could upload and access oral histories because I think we're all trying to do the same thing and we're all small and have no money and no staff. So I think for that, this is really great. Um, so I'm so, and I apologize for being late, but I'm so glad that I came because this is so helpful um, I'm excited about it, and I don't know too much about, um, you know, we, we've we done oral histories, but I mean, it's not anything super involved or anything like that, so I really want to learn more about it and try to be the person, because I'm um, one of the younger people in our group, and so, like, even just emailing photos, it's like, they need help with that sometimes, so it's, I feel like I can be somebody that can help get this um, implemented with the different museums in the area. Cause there's just a lot of history here that um, I'm worried because if there's not an interest from the younger people, it's gonna just disappear with the older folks. And I know um, some of them are having a hard time kind of letting go of the control of museums and not wanting to introduce young people in to kind of help um, move forward and so and um, this might be something that we can definitely use for that whole like on a larger scale with all the museums in the county so thank you so much for your time Zach this is great my my pleasure yeah yeah and I think that that inclusion of of you know young adults and or teens um with uh the potentially older generation or generations who would be interviewed. And I'm seeing a lot of folks wanting to start these projects that are taking, you know, teens to being the, the ones that are interviewing and do, conducting the oral histories for, um, for the project. And I feel like that's such like a great uh, integration of, of the like different services that a public library or a museum, you know, local history museum could um, or school could uh, could include and like, yeah, I, whether you have, you know, whether it's it's through this platform or through your oral history kits, you know, Heather, like that's, um, I feel like, yeah, the letting go of the best practices, once again, you guys know, like when you're saying that, Zach, I was just like, preach, amen, because <laughs> I am all about letting go of perfection uh, because perfection can be so paralyzing in so many things and we can't, we need to do something. We need to be, do 
the gooder practices, you know? Uh, so yeah, yeah. And Jonathan has said over chat, the all-in-one location is nice. Being able to schedule recordings at one point online is helpful. Having functions in one spot helps with workflows and assignments, assignments. Very true. It's like, does, you don't have to be logging in and mm, logging out and seeing what's been done. The platform makes it easy to connect with the community. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, and once again, it's just seems, this seems like super safe, you know, uh, in the current environment that we're in and we're, that we're going to be in for several more months, so. Um, I have one last thought, of, but before I share anything, uh, Heather, what'd you think? Um, I, I think it's really cool. Um, you know, we have such a, we have, we have, our budgets have been cut. I mean, everybody's budget has been cut, but um, ours has really been realigned. And so it has the possibility, I'll admit, um, and, and my partner may be watching this later, but we have some issue with change in our, in our, I mean, if we had all the money, I don't know that people would latch onto something new because it's different and it's not the way we've done it before. Um, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> I just don't know that I can get my folks to buy into it. Um, mm -hmm because we have all this, we have, because we have such a large oral history program already, we have this thing that we do. <laughs> but, um, and actually I, um, I didn't put this all together and I've watched so many webinars this year, um, but I have been on one of your webinars before and I don't remember when or where, but I sent, I attended a Their Story webinar and I sent the stuff to Benji. I mean, I, and it, when you put up the logos at the beginning, I was like, oh, I know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Devon said to show up at one. And so that's what I did. I didn't pay attention to what I was showing up for. Did you learn so, anything yeah. new? Yeah. Um. I think about the transcripts. I think I learned more about the transcripts. And, um, but you know, you get to the, I've gotten to the point this year that I've gone to so many webinars. I just like, they just all, it's all in there. And at some point it'll, I guess, come out. But, but I think it's a great product. I think that you, you've got a really cool tool here. And the fact that organizations and individuals can use it, it's big. Um, Cause I don't know that, I think, I personally feel like that for me, getting the kids and the grandkids of the elder people to do those interviews where it is a conversation and, and maybe less sterile in a way than somebody who doesn't know the person um, very well might help. Um, and so being able to, to have it that way is, I think it's cool. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. Like, I feel like this is a, a tool that can, you know, it's like, we want you guys to learn more about what's out there. Like I was just, when I learned about it, I was just like, holy moly, this is great. Like very cool. Um, and then, but it's also like, you, you know, whether you guys decide on, to implement whatever, you know, it's, it's all about having this information, being able to bring back to uh, your public and say, because you never know, you might get someone in public that's like, hey, I really want to start a oral history program with my uh, church, with my, you know, whatever, or my family. And it's, it's another tool in the tool belt that you guys could potentially um, send out there. Um, it'd be, maybe we should have another webinar on, on transcripts too, that, that could be, that could be interesting. And like, um, yeah. Cool. Writing it, writing it down because like, it's like everything's just going, if I don't write it down. Okay. Totally. Totally. Um, yeah. A, a couple maybe thoughts in, in closing as we're, we're coming up here. So one just interesting note is that uh, aviary does integrate with Trent. You can do like a generated transcript and Trent pull it back in that, that kind of thing. And they have their own auto transcription uh, uh, as well. But um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, a couple a couple of points based on what you all were saying. I mean, one, just starting with Jonathan's point about making it easy to connect with the community and make inroads. I mean, that that like that to me is what this is all about is making more connected communities and facilitating dialogue. And when we saw, like, for example, the the Oregon Jewish Museum um, in in Portland when they sent out their first call for, hey, does anyone want to share their story? They had over 70 people right away say, yep, we're interested. I mean, it's, it's, it's a meaningful, like who doesn't want to share their story, especially at this time. And it's a meaningful way to have an excuse or I mean, not just to actually do something meaningful, but have an excuse to have a conversation, not just to send me this or something. Like you're going to sit down with someone, you're going to make the time to really hear them. Uh, and if nothing else, when you hit stop recording, you can say, hey, uh, what's other like feedback? How can we serve you better? Like you, you actually have an excuse to connect with a ton of people <laughs> and build relationships and relationships are, is how change is made and it's by people. And so this is a great way to just actually engage the community. And oh, by the way, as you're doing it, you're adding to the historical record, creating uh, like an actual narrative of the times through the voices of, of, uh, of the community that's accessible now for future generations and can be used in educating students so on and so forth. And uh, so, yeah, I love, I love that point about making inroads in the community. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention too about the idea of um, it, having an existing oral history program and being used for you know, staff you know, of, of one or, or, or that kind of thing. Same thing with the, um, uh, or, or the idea of doing this as a community. I love the idea of doing it together as a community and funding together. No issues with that at all. Uh, that's fantastic. The Council of American Jewish Museums, that was the approach they took, where they had nine uh, uh, pilot museums that were collecting together, uh, the Oregon Jewish Museum being, being one of those uh, that I just mentioned, Holocaust Museum of LA, so on and so forth. And they did this in a shared environment and because of how their story is structured, they could actually do this collection together and have um, uh, and choose to have access the same way that I was mentioning how students in their class kind of share it. They did that, but each museum and they onboarded over 300, or excuse me, uh, over 30 volunteer interviewers. And in three months uh, did almost 300 oral history interviews. Um, the Oregon Jewish Museum was able to have one staff member dedicated to the project. They themselves, because they had an existing oral history program and because they had a, a good volunteer network, they were able to get uh, uh, over 20 volunteer interviewers and they themselves did over 150 oral history uh, interviews because they actually had the infrastructure, it was a boon for them. Um, and what uh, Alicia Babstein, who, who runs that program had said to me was that this was something they always looked at bigger museums and institutions as like, oh, that's what they do. Uh, and they can kind of do these projects at scale and make those accessible and so on and so forth. But what this kind of workflow and their story, aviary and now permanent um, kind of allows them to do is to actually do that same work with limited resources uh, in a way that they thought that they never would be able to do. And, and now based on this initial um, kind of pilot that the Council of American Jewish Museums did, um, they're now expanding that to 22 museums that are all collecting together um, and we're able to actually use that initial success as evidence to, uh, to receive a grant. Uh, to expand that work. And so that is, that is, you know, our, our hope is that this is meaningful work that can lead to like, what does modern community engagement practices look like? Um, and in a way that you can even leverage those assets um, uh, going forward and build relationships. And how can that help with things like fundraising, uh, increasing volunteer engagement, uh, set up community programming, so, so on and so forth. And so that is kind of like, the work that we are really trying to do and proud of. It's like, yes, it's fun to get the big names and it's even more fun to get, you know, all the groups that otherwise wouldn't be doing this work and do that uh, collaboratively and collectively. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. Really appreciate your time and um, showing us this tool. And I'm just really, whether like I ever get to use their story or not, I'm just really, excited that we have these options like it was not that long ago like we just haven't had these types of options where it's like user-friendly archivist 
talking with archivists and librarians about what we need and our standards and things like that's really the main thing that I'm just like let's have more like let's just even if I don't ever get to play with this stuff I'm glad that um that it's out there and that there are options and there are people listening to us so um yeah so thank you so much um thank you all for attending it is amazingly December 17th today so happy holidays to you all I'm gonna see you all in 2021 um yeah so take care everybody and thank you all so much <laughs>